Um, my name is Jim Walker. I'm one of the directors here at Walk 21. Uh, and we're delighted today to uh, be hosting a session with Helge Hilnhutter. Um, He's the Associate Professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, the Institute of Architecture and Planning. He's well known around the world for his work, particularly about walking and public transport. And this is something that is often overlooked, isn't it, Helge? I'm, I'm not quite sure why, but you, you've been studying this for some years now. Uh, what, mm. what do you think? It, was it just you? Were you the first person to think about these things, about thinking <laughs> about catchments and walkable catchments? No, no, I was, of course, not the first person who th started thinking about this, but um, it's it surprised us when we started to how little there was. Um, there is, we don't have a clear explanation why this is so. Um, we were just more and more surprised when we understood how important it is for public transport, how 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 much walking is actually involved. Um, but yeah, the reasons, it's quite difficult to say. Well, you're, you're, be, yeah. you're leading us now, you're leading us now, and we do appreciate it. And I think it really helps with this. What, what is often under undercounting, isn't it, that happens when people talk about walking. Uh, and I think I think what you're going to help us with today is demonstrating how walking and public transport are really the best friends. We're often uh, put together with cycling because we're, in, in theory, well, we are, I guess, non-motorized modes. But um, there's so much more that we've got in common, isn't there, with uh, public transport. And we're all really looking forward to hearing about your talk today. We're going to talk for about an hour. I mean, if it's a little bit less than that, that's fine. We've got a few people online with us as well. If people have got questions, can you just put them in the chat and I'll try and uh, address those at, at the end. Uh, but otherwise, Helgi, uh, I should also mention you're a, a board member of uh, Walk21 Europe. Well, thank you for that uh, and your leadership about helping us set the agenda, I think. Uh, and looking forward. You've worked in countries as far as Tanzania, China, Bahrain, you know, lots of places where you've been exploring these things. So this is certainly a, a global subject of global interest. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we were we were actually together in Norway earlier this week. But um, here we are, a chance to capture things and be able to share it around the world. Helge Hilnota from uh, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, please uh, share us your thoughts about walking and public transport. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, okay, you should see my presentation now. I yeah. have four points that I would like to talk through with you um, on that subject, walking and public transport. Um, what are the potentials and the possibilities we have? So I start first with a background and then I show you how important walking is for public transport and then we look a bit into practical possibilities what could you do and what has an effect um, yes I start with a very basic question walking what is it actually um, it's it is I mean we walk every day usually most of us do um, and it's deeply integrated into our daily lives we don't think about it anymore pretty much because it, we just do it we are highly skilled we learn to walk when we're one year old um, and that's can be an advantage, but that is also perhaps a challenge um, in communicating walking. I have a short video that illustrates what is possible on foot in terms of transport. So when we consider walking as transport, this is kind of possible. It's not dangerous. Uh, it happens every 60 seconds, a very busy junction in uh, Tokyo. Um, this is not possible on cyclists. For cyclists, that would be complete chaos. Of not, of course, not by cars, but it illustrates nicely that walking is something completely different than uh, cycling, for example. So, so, so this gives an interesting impression, and we see also how, how walking is actually quite smart mobility because there are no machines so far that can do this with this ease as human beings can do on foot. So this is a nice illustration for what walking is and how different it is to other forms of transport. Um, 
And walking is an outdoor mobility. So when we are on foot outdoor in the city, we are out, we are exposed to the environment around us. The only buffer is basically our clothes, if you want. So whatever takes place around us has an effect on how we experience walking. And when we walk, we have a walking always generates a sensory experience. Um, we kind of collect information on the environment around us with our five sense organs. Um, and we can't switch this off. This is just happening. We, we're not always aware of this, but um, it, 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 it is very important, of course, to navigate and to be safe and so on. Um, but this is quite important and shaping an impression on how we experience walking. And this is now going into psychology, of course, and uh, so here is a lot of knowledge on how this works. So we have five sense organs and they send information to the brain and then the brain is processing this. What they find is quite important and interesting is that um, about 80% of that information that goes to the brain is actually visual information. So what we see is quite important for how we perceive and understand our physical surrounding or also our social surroundings. And in the next slide, I have um, a short video. I would like you to ask to look at where people have their eyes. So we filmed pedestrians in different urban environments and look at where they direct their sight. Where do they have their eyes? So here it's rather boring. It's a long closed facades. And this lady is just looking downwards on the pavement, short up here, right in the city center. This is different. She turns her hat frequently. She's catching up with whatever is going on around her. It's obviously attracting her attention. Here again, lots of cars, boring facades, nothing much going on. So just looking down on the pavement and get through it. And here again, he's attaching, he's attracted by everything that is going on. He's not looking down, he's frequently turning his head. Um, so that is obviously interesting. Here again, boring, he's kind of like detaching from whatever is around, just checking that he's not hitting that light post. And that is another possibility to kind of do something when walking, where walking is rather boring. So you entertain yourself by your phone or something like this. So, so this short film illustrates that walking behavior differs quite obviously between different environments. And you don't have to be a scientist on, to see the difference. So we have environments where pedestrians obviously are attracted by what, them what they are surrounded by and, and other environments where pedestrians turn away and kind of direct their sight downwards. And there's nothing to look at, basically. So the first conclusion is urban environments are relevant for walking. This is what this video illustrates. Um, the question now is, what does that mean? Can we explain this? How can we understand this? And how does the urban environment shape the walking experience? And here we, of course, have to look into psychology again. So they have worked, of course, with this. There's lots of knowledge existing that we can use to explain this. So the urban environment, we that we kind of understand through our five sense organs, we collect information on that. There's two things. It influences our emotions and it influences how we perceive time. And I will explain both quickly to you. It's not so difficult, actually. Um, this is a model to kind of define emotions that psychologists have developed during the 80s. They've tested that in very different uh, uh, cultures and they agree on this. So when you have a textbook for students, you find this in. Of course, this is much more complex um, and research is going on and uh, it's not so much uh, that where kind of the, the community of scientists is unified, but this model, they say, yeah, that works actually quite well. And there are two dimensions that are important for emotions as they find. The one is stimulation, and this is how much informa information our brain receives from our environment. And the other dimension is pleasantness. And this is if we experience the information that our brain receives as pleasant or as unpleasant. 
And in terms of emotion, it means this high stimulation, much information that is unpleasant. It's emotions like stress or fear. High stimulation that is pleasant, we enjoy something. We are, we, we are quite interested or something. That's emotions in these directions. And little stimulation that is unpleasant, we are getting a bit tired or we are bored and pleasant. Um, low stimulation, we manage to relax. Well, it's actually quite simple and we can nearly intuitively kind of understand this model by our own experience. Now, we now started and said, okay, how could we measure these two dimensions? And the question of pleasantness, we asked people, we, you have to talk to people to understand what they consider as pleasant or unpleasant. And stimulation, I showed actually already. So we understood what we see is quite important. So we took as a measure the number of head movements. How often turn people their head in different urban environments? We have a big data set on that. And we actually can, through statistics, quite nicely see that there is a very significant difference um, between different environments. So we could measure these two elements, and um, then we put that back into this model. And what we find was not very surprising. I show it to you anyway now. So high stimulation that is not pleasant that that is linked to stress is wherever we have cars around and this is not surprising because cars are a fatal danger for pedestrians there's no option to turn away from this you have to follow up when you cross the street you have to turn your head and this is what we see actually there are quite a lot of head turns basically when pedestrians have to interact with cars um, in pedestrian streets, this is different. Um, it is highly stimulating, as we've seen in the video. Um, and people say, yeah, we like this. We, we find this pleasant. It's nothing where you have to follow up. It's not forced because it's not dangerous just to kind of do something else, look on your phone or something. But we see that most pedestrians are actually attracted by whatever is around them. So they are stimulated and people say this is pleasant. And in green environments, stimulation goes down, but everybody likes it. People report, yes, this is a pleasant walking experience. Um, and this is exactly what happens when we walk in green environments. Uh, we manage to relax and we all know this from our own experience. When we go for a walk in the weekend or something, we probably look for a park or somewhere where it's relaxing to walk. And we all know these urban areas we're walking is, we would describe it straight away as boring. And, and this is exactly what we measure. It's um, stimulation goes far down um, and nobody is saying this is a pleasant environment to be and this is a pleasant environment to walk. So we can actually measure this. And this is the important takeaway here. Um, we can measure the urban influence or the, the influence of urban environments on our emotions, they do something with it. Of course, emotions are influenced by much more, but the environment has an effect, obviously, that we can measure. Now, time experience um, or time perception, how psychologists investigate this since about 100 years. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge on how the perception of time changes. So time can stretch, it can be shorter. We all know this from experience. Um, and for walking, this means when time passes fast, um, the distance gets shorter and we have the impression that we are getting forward. So the walking speed is increasing in a way, the perceived walking speed. And this is what we want. So we want um, to pass time fast, that we have the feeling, yes, we're getting there. The distance is not that long. I can actually reach things on foot. Um, and psychologists explain find an important factor here again is stimulation. Um, low stimulation, time gets long, things stretch. And high stimulation, time gets short. We miss the sense for time and then we suddenly at some point, oh, it's over already. So we all know this again, probably from our own experience, these situations. Um, so, and we can measure this effect. So psychologists have lots of uh, statistics on this, lots of numbers. They coll collected lots of data and their meta studies that kind of put everything together. And when we use these 
these measures from psychology and put them back to our measures of stimulation, we can actually put figures on how the perception of time varies in different urban environments. And the worst is an underground, as we see up here in the left corner, that here time gets very long and short time experience happens in busy urban environments as a busy urban square, for example, and we the, the maximum dis difference between these two extremes is about 30%. So it's quite a lot. Um, and then we have different environments in between where we have variations. Um, so the, the important point here again is this is not a soft factor. We can actually measure this with the help of psychological knowledge, we can put a figure on this. Now I explained um, how the urban environment is influencing walking. Um, it influences our perception of travel time, distance and speed. And in terms of transport, this is of course very central for what we can reach on foot or what we think is reachable on foot and then we walk, right? So we have all these uh, topics and discussions around the 10 minute city and so on. This is influenced by urban environments and how the urban environment influences our perception of time and but also distances. And the second is the urban environment influences our emotions. And emotions is perhaps a bit more difficult. What has that to do with transport? Yes, of course, it influences how we choose to be mobile. If we constantly feel miserable when we walk, we probably choose something else. Maybe we sit on a cycle, but quite likely people get to their cars if they have them. Um, so these emotions, how the urban environment influences our emotions when we walk are quite important for how we choose to travel and this is what we walk for what we fight for to reduce car driving is a big topic um, and and urban environments are important for that so the urban environment influences if we walk and how far we accept to walk so this is quite important and we can measure this so these are not soft factors now let's have a bit look into the role of walking for public transport. Is that only the first and last mile? It's often called like this, even in research, it's called like the first and last mile. And then we look at public transport. This is what gives it the name. It's a public transport journey. And then there's a bit before and after, but we don't care so much about it. But we know all from experience, whoever kind of has traveled with public transport, this is not just a ride on a public transport for hills. Um, we start at home, we have to get to a public transport stop, we may walk, we may take a cycle, and we stand at the stop, we have to wait for two, three, four, five minutes. And then we kind of board a public transport for hills, we have that ride and that public transport service stops again just at a station or public transport stops and from there we have to walk again or to cycle or whatever we have available there to reach actually our final destination that might be a workplace or university or school or whatever it is so any public transport journey um, has at least four trip legs as we call it and when we when you think of you you have to change transfer from one um, form of public transport to another, then there's something in between and it's getting more complex. It's then at least five triplex. Usually you have to walk and wait again and so on. So, so you see a public transport journey is com composed of different elements. And it's actually, when you look at it in detail from the perspective of travelers, it's a quite complex journey um, that has always a certain number of triplex. And we looked now onto how do people get to public transport from their homes. So we look at the side, kind of the home side of the journey, um, and that is going from homes to stops and the way back when you travel towards your home. And we have data from 12 different cities in uh, five countries on three continents, so they are quite different actually. Um, and this is what we see. So all the blue bars show the percentage of walking at the home end of the public transport journeys in these cities. We see that we have some cities that have slightly lower part of walking, like the Vienna region. Um, there 
has 31% car driving. So it is, they have a big train system and, and these people drive to train stations. Um, and we have some other urban areas. Brisbane has a bit higher car share and, and in Limburg, it's a, a region in the Netherlands. They cycle, that is nice. But in general, we see even in these cities that are large, like Brisbane is a city of with 3 million inhabitants, um, it's low density, so it's spread it around. around. Even there, um, um, they have a big train system that is kind of the backbone of the system. Even there, they 76% walk. Um, this is quite interesting. And also in, in, in Vienna and these less dense areas or in Limburg, the, the highest share is walking. And in all the other cities, even though big cities um, and, or smaller cities with Augsburg, like in Germany or Fürth is 80,000 inhabitants, as I remember, um, Basel in Switzerland, something like 200,000. So, so these cities differ quite, or Vienna is 2 million inhabitants or 1.8. So they are quite different, but everywhere walking is by far the most important share of how for, for getting two public transport stops at the home end. And then we looked, of course, at the other side, what happens there, and that's just walking, basically. And that is, of course, easy because you can't, it's difficult to take a bike or car on, on a bus or a train. So when you kind of reach your destination, people mostly walk. Um, this changed slightly in the last years with more shared mobility or something, but by far the kind of the numbers that we see, we have new numbers from, from Denmark um, right now. It's just walking, basically. The, the share of walking is always over 90%, very clearly. Um, and we saw even, it didn't change via Corona or something. Of course, the, the use of public transport changed through Corona, but not how we use public transport. So walking is quite dominant for getting to public transport, but also getting to the final destination at the end of the trip. And then we looked into travel time. We, we were interested in how much time do spend people where. And what we see we were was also quite interesting. We saw that about 50% of the journey, people are on public transport vehicles. This is giving the name to the journey. It's a public transport journey, but, but about 50%, they're not passengers. They're actually pedestrians. They're in part cyclists. And they also stand and wait in urban environments at stops in stations and so on so half of the travel time people are public transport users are pedestrians most of them and this third element is something that is a little bit special this comes from um, a research institute social data that was led by Werner Brück um, and they did something interesting where they have when they did travel surveys, they asked people open questions. So, so they asked them, what do you remember from that journey that you took yesterday by bus or by tram or train? And then people come up with all kinds of uh, memories and things that I didn't like or things that didn't work out and so on. Um, and, and this is quite difficult actually to manage in a quantitative manner because they don't just ask that 400 people. They ask this, the data set behind um, that behind the figures I showed you has 7,000 public transport journeys. And they ask 7,000 times this question. So it's quite complex, but they developed the system over many years to kind of uh, standardize that and quantify that. And what they see is that about 70% of the memories that that travelers report freely on a public transport journey derive from the time when they were pedestrians. So this is quite interesting. So, so the memory of a public transport journey is more shaped by the time we walk, we are pedestrians, than by the time we are actually passengers. And this is an important takeaway, of course, because, I mean, we call it a public transport journey, but what is shaping it is actually the time that we spend on foot. And when we look at these figures that I just presented, it's very clear that uh, public transport is also walking, um, to, and walking is actually quite important for public transport. Um, and this was, at that point, we were astonished um, that there is com relatively little research on walking related to public transport, because we saw it is so important. It is such a big part of that journey. 
So conclusion one, first and last mile doesn't make sense. That is kind of, you, when you say that, you try to make something small that isn't small. And I think, and that is related to your question, Jim, at the beginning, um, I think that we kind of um, under-evaluated walking and try to make it small for some reasons. Um, is a limitation for public transport since many, many decades. Um, we, you, we cannot make public transport attractive when we only focus on this on this public transport part of the journey, because it is just not true that that's all, and that's the most central element. All the investments in public transport infrastructure in in the, in the memory of people goes to these 30%. And this is quite important to remember. So what are we doing with these other 70%? What is happening there? Do we have any control? What knowledge do we have there? How can we improve that? These are important questions when we want to support public transport as these figures show relatively clear. Um, and then the question, of course, is walking in public transport, is it effective to reduce car traffic? Because that's kind of the big overall challenge that we all have. Um, and I did uh, um, a relatively simplistic analysis. Um, this is, I used the model split data from, I think it's 56 cities, and I plotted them in this graph here, in this um, table. And what I did is I basically used um, the, the model share of walking and the model share of public transport. Um, and the color indicates the share of car driving in these cities. So we see then cities that have a high share of walking and we see cities that have a high share of public transport. So in this field that is named one, there are, these are cities that have high shares of public transport. They're doing really well with public transport, but they have low shares of walking. And the dots remain relatively dark. That means these cities have still a quite high share of car driving, which is interesting. And when we look at then at the uh, at the on the on the other end, there are cities with high shares of walking, but lower shares of public transport. Um, they seem to perform slightly better to in reducing car driving. These dots that indicate the city is getting a bit lighter. So we have red colors and so on and light blue. And then we move when we move upwards the other extreme where we have cities that have a really high share of public transport and at the same time a high share of walking in the field that is uh, named with five up there in the upper right corner. We see actually that the, the combination of walking and public transport is quite seems quite effectively to, to reduce car driving. So these cities are all kind of, they all have um, shares of car driving below 30%. So they obviously perform quite well. So there seems something, this combination of walking and public transport that seems to fit, that seems to kind of be an effective um, measure to reduce car driving basically. Um, okay, uh, four, and now I'm getting a bit into the practical questions around public transport and walking. How can we deal with this? What could we, what is, what is it the effects that we could consider when we have good walking environments? What is happening? What does that mean for public transport? And also getting a bit into what we can actually do to support walking and access to public transport. This is, these are results from a very old study um, in, that has been done in Vienna, and they did a very simple differentiation. They said, we look at what we call pedestrian-oriented environments, and we look at car-dominated environment. These were the two kind of uh, sorts of environments that they investigated. And what they found is that in pedestrian-oriented environments, people walk 70% longer distances to public transport services as in car dominated environment and this was uh, the figure is quite large actually so when we when we looked at it we thought can this be true 70% is it's a lot um but we couldn't find any mistakes or something that was really critical um and that yeah, we were astonished, but that we could kind of achieve such a large effect. And when we look at it from another perspective, um, we see in this simplified manner how how we kind of look at public transport stops and which urban environment is accessible to from uh, for this stop. Um, the catchment area around the stop is getting much larger when people walk longer, um, and it is simplified 
picture as I show here, it's actually three times as large. So that would mean that attractive walking environments around public transport stop have a potential to triple the amount of potential customers for public transport. That is a quite large figure. It's extensive. So we couldn't achieve that with uh, increasing, increasing the urban density. We would have to demolish everything and build from scratch. That's often not possible and not really um, a, a desirable option, but upgrading walking environments is something that you probably could achieve much cheaper and much faster. So, so this gives an interesting perspective on the potential that good walking environments have for public transport and for the number of clients that have access to public transport or that consider public transport to be in a walkable distance, to be in an acceptable walking distance. Um, well, we also looked at this in a bit more detail where we analyzed footpath networks and something. And then, of course, it's no longer these 300% increase that we see, but we still see increases of 60, 80, 120, 150%, which is quite substantial, actually. So the big question now is how could we achieve this effect? What could make people walk substantially longer to public transport stops? What is relevant for them to kind of walk longer? That walking is getting more practical, more attractive, um, that people would walk longer. Um, so, and I have four points. So we investigated this. This was an kind of a starting point for, for an investigation that we did. Um, and I have four points that kind of show an effect. Um, the first one is something that I explained earlier already. So it's urban, we need urban environments for, that support good emotions and where distances appear short. Um, I explained how that works, um, what we need for this and what is important. Um, so, but the general principles for this, the first one, we have two. The first one is variation. And these two pictures illustrate that nicely. So when I pass by these white buildings, nothing is changing. I do not have the impression that I'm getting forward. On the other side, um, we have buildings that vary. So when I pass by these buildings, I have the impression that I'm passing by something. I'm getting forward. And that influences our time perception. So we need urban environments that have a certain amount of variation that kind of fits to the human scale. And that is the next principle that is important. We need environments in a human scale. This is neither something really new. Um, I think Jan Gehl is writing on that since 40 years or something. And we are teaching this our students and I learned this at university, but we understand now better what this is. The human scale is in principle, and I explained that earlier, um, the human scale is in principle the distance from our body where our sense organs work best, right? So we can touch things that are one, one and a half meters away. We can smell something, a person with lots of perfume or something when it but when that person passes by two, three meters distance, that is possible to smell. You get a sense of smell. You hear a conversation that is relatively close, three, four meters. You can hear that. You can see details when things getting close. But all this is kind of fading out when things getting further away. And we see that pedestrians react mostly on things that are five to six meters away from our body. This is the distance where our sense organs work best and where they can provide us with information on the urban environment so that we are stimulated. So this is the second principle. Um, and then the second element that has an influence on walking distances to public transport, as we found, is to provide access to shops and services along walking access that lead to public transport or close around stops. Um, we see um, in the data we have collected is that people walk, exact, walk substantially longer when they have possibilities to do that. And the explanation is relatively simple. It's um, when you're on foot, it's quite simple to enter a shop to buy 
is something to go to a doctor or something. You don't have to park a car. You don't even have to lock a bike. Um, you are in and out on the go, basically. So this is very effective. And when you're traveling by public transport, you are on foot. Most of travelers are on foot. And for them, it's quite practical when you, for example, on the way home, can kind of purchase some groceries for preparing dinner or something. This makes it very practical and often it might save you um, an extra journey because you can do things along the trip, along the journey you're, you're doing. So the effect is 15 to 25% longer accepted walking distances. This is what we found. And the third element is something that we all know. Um, it's when we have to cross streets, we have to mostly wait, um, especially traffic streets. And the effect that I show here, these 10 to 15% is not something as we see in the picture. Um, it is actually a four lane busy road with 1500 cars per hour. So this is kind of like traffic really. When you have a, a busy road um, that you have to cross before you reach a stop, um, basically, um, the time that you need to get to the stop is 10 to 15 percent waiting. Basically, you, you, you're not getting anywhere. You just have to wait to cross that street. Um, and the problem is, this is just an average. When you want to be sure that you're early enough at the stop on the other side to catch a bus, this doubles. You have to wait. You have to actually account for 30 percent longer time to get to the stop and this is something to do with the walking distance so when when people know it takes such small long time when you have to cross that street it's getting less attract attractive it takes more time to get to the stop and the effect is quite substantial um, and and often not seen or not measured really um, and this is a problem because it is there and public transport services of course also in many cases drive along these big busy roads because there they can drive fast these roads are most direct and so on so this is a problem that is nearly built into our public transport system um, quite often that stops and also stations and so on they are not far away from these busy roads and then we have this effect um, just by crossing over these roads and kind of getting through that traffic it's a quite strong barrier effect that um, car traffic has for access to public transport and then the fourth element um, is actually split it in two. Um, it's, uh, we need good footpath networks and obstacle-free paths to public transport. So the network discussion, that is kind of investigated quite long, um, since quite a while, and there are lots of studies that show this effect. What we measure is kind of 10 to 25% when you have a dense footpath network that provides direct paths to the stop. This is quite effective, but as soon as you have um, underpasses and bridges over railway lines or, or uh, motorways or something, you quite in many instances you have to walk a quite long detour and and that kind of lengthens distances to public transport or you have like um, a large factory or something that is fenced in and everybody has to walk long detours around it it makes it ineffective and unpractical um, so so this is something that's quite often investigated um, and the other part no obstacles in streets is something that we didn't find much literature literature about but we measured a quite strong effect and this is a picture from the uk where one tries to kind of guide pedestrians uh, to the most safe place to cross the street and so on. But what it does as well is, of course, it, it kind of requires to walk a nearly ridiculous detour. I mean, you see where you want to go and you see where you have to go and you understand, you're fully aware of that you are sent a quite long detour to get to the other side of the road. And, and the car traffic doesn't have that. You see that as well. They can just drive through, but, but you as pedestrian have to walk a detour to so it's quite annoying actually and we measured the effects um, of kind of the streetscape um, it can be up to 20 percent so in worst cases this actually lengthens walking distances to stops quite substantially and it's important because walking distances are not so long so for a 300 meter distance 
um, it, it goes very quickly that kind of you have 10 20 percent of the tour when you for example move um, an overpath over a street out from the most um, practical positions from a pedestrian protect perspective and we do this quite often because we, there might be a curvature and and cars need to have free sight and they of course we want them to drive 50 kilometers per hour and then we move kind of this overpath out of the most practical positions for pedestrians so that cars can see and that's safe and everything and then the pedestrians are left to walk the tours and we do this in urban planning on maps with the way with the scale in one to one thousand uh, it's just some centimeters. We're not aware of that this is actually relevant for public transport access um, and for pedestrians, especially when they are in a hurry when getting to a stop. So this has a quite important effect, but it's not really addressed. It, I, I, we don't see that there is a clear awareness on, on this uh, challenge. All right, I have now kind of talked you through these four elements, good emotions and short precise distances, accessible stops and uh, accessible shops and services, crossing traffic streets, um, and no obstacles and good networks. And we measured also effects for all these four elements. And when we count the effects together, kind of the dif difference between the best and the worst case, we very easily get to these 70%. That's no problem. And, and this is interesting because we suddenly understand how kind of the urban environments influences and how it actually can lead to this big effect that we saw at the beginning and that we couldn't explain really. We just saw that big number, but it when we crack it down and we kind of do we did research on it and, and we suddenly can understand how this comes about and this is quite important i think actually we can do something with it and we now understand what is an, a walking environment that actually supports access to public transport and this is the conclusion it's it's urban planning it's urban design it's transport planning it's very doable it's nothing that we have to wait some 20 way, years for and then we have to buy some costly technology from a company or something it's something that we're doing already so it is we have systems for this, we just need to do it right. Just a short conclusion. So I talked you through what is walking and I explained how what shapes our experience of walking, um, how urban environments influences emotions and uh, perception of time. I showed how important walking, walking is for public transport and I showed how walking environments actually have an influence on walking to public transport and what we can how we can improve these urban environments well first walking is an outdoor mobility i explained that earlier and we understand now very well that also public transport is actually an outdoor mobility is not just sitting on a means of public transport it is quite a lot walking waiting and quite a lot of the journey is outside in the public urban space of cities and then we have cycling. I haven't talked about cycling, but it's the same. It's also taking place outdoors in these urban environments. And when we understand this, we see these are the most important options for uh, to, to, uh, mobility alternatives for car driving, right? So, so this is kind of, these three are the most important alternatives that we have for car driving today. And when we see how important the urban environment is for all these three options, we understand how that this is a very critical factor to reduce car driving. If we do not manage to build more urban environments that are attractive for people, for walking, for getting to public transport, for cycling, it will be difficult, it will remain difficult to reduce car driving in cities and all these broad uh, challenges that are linked to car driving. And it's not just, uh, um, we won't solve this with electric cars to the full extent, we all know this. What we see also when we understand um, the relationship between walking and public transport, how much walking is actually going on in cities. Um, these are just examples, right? Copenhagen is known as a cycling city. The walking is much more. If we understand for each public transport journey generates quite a lot of walking and we have lots of uh, trips that are just undertaken by walking. So that makes 
gives us an impression how important walking still is. Um, and this is interesting because it stands in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a hefty contrast towards how much money we spend on transport, how much how, the, the budgets, how much attention um, these kind of alternatives to the car receive. Walking often has the least and often um, we do not really understand or know even how to support walking through urban planning and so on. So this is a harsh contrast when we see these figures because there's lots of walking going on in cities, but we are not kind of it's not recognized to the extent as it should. Um, and there's another perspective on public transport that we can take now, actually, and that um, researchers start to take on. Um, it's not, it's, yeah, it's walking for public transport, where we can also turn it around, public transport for more walking. And what public, public transport does is it essentially links two urban areas where you are able to walk. Right. So um, and, and researchers have recognized this and they started investigating the health effect of public transport journeys, which is a bit funny because public transport is not understood as a physical active mode, but indeed it contains so much physical active mobility, walking mostly, that it has an effect. So we have figures on that and there's a research um, area, it's still small, but it's developing, where health researchers look into the positive health effects of using public transport. This is, for example, an argument that is very rarely used to support public transport, but it is actually there and it is measurable. And finally, when, when we understand the relationship between walking and public transport, so promoting walking and public transport together in, an, in a well-organized manner is very likely to result in synergy effects. Where getting more out of the investments or the efforts that we are taking to support both modes. So we are getting a higher return from public transport investments. And this is what societies ask us when we spend money on public transport, of course. And we have also seen it's, it can be quite effective to reduce car driving simply because these two modes fit well together. Um, they this works well. And this is also the background for this synergy effect that we have. In principle, we can understand that simplistic, uh, as pedestrians, we are quite flexible, we can turn, we can move, we can, um, but we are not so fast. Um, and public transport is the opposite. Public transport is faster, it drives and so on, and there's a higher speed, um, but it's not so flexible. Right, so it goes along lines. It goes, it's organized with timetables and so on. So these two different, um, uh, uh, diff diff different principles, or these two different characteristics, fit very well together, and they make kind of uh, the a public transport journey. So this is um, actually something that we need to recognize and we can get much more out of our investments and our efforts to support walking and public transport when we kind of coordinate and work together in this. I think this was my last slide. Thank you very much. Algi, thank you so much. That's uh, lots of food for thought and um, you've stimulated several questions in the chat. Um, let me just start though, um, if I may, just to pick up about, you know, sustainable development goals. Let's sort of go back to the highest picture here. Um, there is a sustainable development goal, 11.2, that uh, the custodian is UN Habitat, who is putting a value. They've come up with quite a, a useful system to see how many people are living in cities within 500 meters of accessible public transport. Um, now that varies greatly around the world. I think the average is 65% of, uh, of people in cities. Uh, that's cities is where the data is mainly uh, focused. Uh, I think in Auckland, and we have some people from New Zealand on the call, it, it can be as much as 98%. Um, but in some places like Luanda, I think in Angola, it's as low as 10%. Your, your, your work here seems to have the potential to change that methodology, or, or at least you're questioning not just about distance, but about quality. Is that right? Yes, exactly. I mean, it's it's about quality. Um, and the, the, the thing is, we have lots of, it's 
comparatively easy to kind of measure distances because we ha we have maps and we have data on that and that kind of um, uh, generates lots of interest from research and then lots of publications that kind of investigate this effect and and as you say now even on a global scale we have an idea on what is going on where and so on um, but this is what I talk about is going ex these accessibility research is not um, mostly not recognizing what is the mode of transport used to access public transport which is as I showed it's mostly walking um, and it's logic and and it's kind of taken as given but um, most of these models or most of this type of research on accessibility is based on distances um, it's not telling us who is how do people kind of get over these distances or what mode is used what is relevant for these distances how what what results in variations of these distances so there are lots of assumptions that underlie these models but we can explain much more in detail when we look at what is going on and we see it's walking and then when we look even deeper and understand try to understand what is relevant for walking and this is what i try to present so it kind of gives another layer to this um, research on accessibility where we kind of suddenly can start doing something with this not just understand okay these need people need ex better access to public transport we can also um, understand how we can improve access to public transport so that we potentially attract more clients to public transport systems yeah a uh, very good point and and who's do you, whose job do you think this is is it down to you know we talk a lot now we're moving towards action is it a public transport operator who really needs to hear this message or you know who we who should we be working with is it is it is this a, a job for um citizens to actually sort of demonstrate what where it is they're unhappy with their experiences or is it is it up to local authorities to actually help mm. pull this together where would you see the responsibility lies best well, that probably always depends. In naturally, you would probably say that the responsibility lies in uh, city authorities that have the responsibility for public spaces in general, right? So it's it's under their responsibilities. Our streets, our sidewalks, basically the whole public realm is kind of public urban area that is managed by city authorities. Um, they have formally at least the responsibility for this um, but it it is at least in a very strong interest of public transport um, operators or agencies to kind of see that happening I would say and I think it's therefore it should be kind of it needs to be a corporation. Um, and when we start looking into processes for pu planning public transport, this is also important because it depends where, where do lines go? Where are my buses going? This way or this way or on this street or this street or so on? How far are, what are the distance between the stops? Where are the stops? Are there junctions where they're best accessible or is that one practical for all the cars and then we move them out? So a lot of questions that kind of public transport operate or that in lie in the in the professional field of public transport are also quite relevant here um but i think um uh, it's it's a joint responsibility very much and i mean it's often it's cities that have to pay for public transport services even if they are kind of not uh, always responsible for all the details then and and give that to agencies and so on um i think it's quite important uh, a corporation on this side and we see cities with more and more cities have walking strategies and so on um linking this together um can be much much more effective and and can redeem results for both of them Thank you. And, and we've got a few questions about um, how this might vary, the, the different uh, responses we might get from people with disabilities, uh, children, older people. Um, you know, you're presenting data here about people generally, citizens, yeah. uh, users. Um, have you done any studies or do you know of any studies that have broken this down and sort of understood any differences with um, mm. demands and needs, how it might vary? Yeah. Um i can't kind of point to studies straight away um th there are studies so so kind of how public transport can be used um 
when you have to deal with disabilities and so on, elderly people, um, that is, is a big topic and an important topic. Um, um, and it's getting more and more important because aging societies and all these problems and challenges this, that we see at least in Europe and probably also in other um, societies uh, kind of underline the importance of this. Um, there is quite a lot of knowledge on details. Um, the challenge is that it's getting very diverse. So it's depending on your individual abilities, what you can do and so on. Um, the, the, and, and another challenge is then again that we have established systems that do not work well for these peoples and these public transport systems and all these stations and all, all the infrastructure that we have built over 50, 60 years is not always optimal for that and kind of improving that is a huge challenge and um, we have here in Norway, for example, we have a law it's no choice to kind of when you build something new you have to do it in a way that is kind of accessible for everybody um that helps very much but the existing system that is there already and that is not working is a challenge but it's just something that we need to follow up um i i, I have no figures that kind of relate directly to uh, uh, acceptable access distance and so on um, but what we see, or, or what I always um, like to say is, yes, we kind of use these figures like 400 meters, 500 meters for bus stops at 300 meters. These are um, soft figures. They just serve to enable an analysis. In reality, it depends on, on much more factors that are then very individual to each single traveler or person that kind of influences how far I am willing to walk. What is important, what I think is much more important for planning practice is to understand how can we influence um, accepting walking distances? And we shouldn't look at kind of final distances in meters. We should rather look at percentages where we know, okay, if we do this, we can increase an acceptable walking distance for all travelers, kind of those that walk short and those that walk long. Um, I think and, that is a better yeah, approach. And that's an interesting point, isn't it? So many transport decisions are based on journey time savings. Uh, yeah. But what you're actually proving to us here is there's a perceived time savings. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is really challenging the transport modeling, isn't it? To sort of suggest that perceived time is something, is this something that can be taught? Is, is it something that we could use to influence transport appraisals? Um, we've got had a comment here from New Zealand, for example, that, you know, it just doesn't feature in the business case at the moment. Uh, you know, could we, could we use this sort of research to change the way appraisals uh, actually put better values and demonstrate the investments in quality catchments can actually have a, a better return, maybe the new lines, new uh, or different alternatives, like more punctual services. It's, it's actually about catchments. That's what you're telling us. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's that's it. And I think it is that that is important to understand that kind of walking can be actually a business case for public transport. I think this is um, the important takeaway here. Um, and it puts suddenly uh, a value an, an, a, another value on walking. We have we know this on health and so on, but this is very concrete and it's linked to investments that are done in cities um, when we actually can in, uh, increase the use of public transport that has a good chance to lower car use when we think public transport and walking together, because suddenly then we think of a system that provides access throughout the city, where at least everywhere where we have public transport systems in place. Um, I think this kind of question of a business case is quite important, actually, and um, a provides a strong argument for walking um, in this case. Mm. Maybe still work to do. And, and last question, I think, just um, you're working in a, an academic institution, you know, you're teaching these things, you're a planner, uh, an architect, I think, uh, with that with that training. Um, is it that we now need to sort of teach about emotions and psychology as part of these courses? Is this is this a gap at the moment in uh, in the way that walkability is being taught, or even transport engineering is being taught and planning? Um, how do we overcome that? And um, you know, do you think people will be receptive to adding these these areas into the into courses? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I do teach that. Of course, I'm not a psychologist and I can't uh, teach psychology, but uh, in research, we work together with psychology and sociologists and so on. So these, and in principle, it's when you, when we talk about cities for people or human scales and all these kind of dimensions of uh, the urban environments, um, we need to understand what are people what are human beings what do they need what do they react on and so on of course then we can have to look back on into psychology and so on and i think lots of the norms that we have today for car driving for everything we have lots of standards they are in principle they started developing on these routes at some point and there's lots of research but it's usually not taught anymore it's just then you just learn about these standards how things work and so on and i think for in case of walking we have we are not that far um and i think it also um enables to uh, to understand walking from a very individual perspective where under where i see myself as human being and i understand what is actually taking place when i walk and what is relevant so this psychological perspective I think is important and can can tell us quite a lot on what is a city in a human scale, what are cities for human beings, what do they need this cities need to deliver that 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 they are kind of serving people and not, for example, cars. So um, I think this is an important perspective. We don't have to kind of dig into very complex details of psychology, but it's it's often very rewarding to understand the principles um, that psychologists look at and how they work. Um, and in transport, this is done in research, at least. It's probably not so much in teaching, um, but I th we bring this in in teaching. And we, I think students appreciate this perspective because then they suddenly can, it's it's not something, it's something that they, re where they recognize themselves in it. And I think that helps. Yeah, I mean, they call it civil engineering, but we mustn't forget the, the civil bit as much as the end. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is the point. Helgi, thank you so much. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but um, we we always get on so well. There's so much more we could be talking about. But thank you for the contribution you're making here. Such important research. We've had people from all over the world part of uh, join us this morning here. Um, I think this will, we're going to have other talks, um, and certainly uh, I see uh, Tamara Bozovic, for instance, is uh, doing some really important parallel research into enabling. Uh, accessible environments and I think this is the sort of thing that I think we could extend this series to have uh, explain about how that pick up from your 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 work here about how to actually implement these things you know what what uh, changes mm -hmm. we can deliver on the ground and how to take people with us from public transport operators as you say the the planners uh, in the departments and of course let's not forget the citizens I think making sure that they have a chance to share their views uh, we've got our own tools like the walkability tool that allows people to now record their perceptions of the environment seems, uh, seems to be a, a different uh, approach to the traditional way of we've been trying to audit environments. I think this is uh, we're growing up, aren't we, I guess, as we, we expand our research into action. Uh, and I think it is helping on the ground. Thank you so much on behalf of everyone who's been present today. Thank you, everyone, for being part of the talk. Helga Hilnata, Associate Professor for the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Thank you again for your time today um, and for sharing with us your great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>